you brought up the example of during everybody during COVID, say in-person fitness was over, people's routines had changed and they just weren't going to do it anymore. And we're just sitting here like, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now you hear the same thing about at home. Now it's at home is dead, which is equally ridiculous. People train at home. They will always train at home. They just do that and some other things. Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Veneri. Today I'm joined by Brian Kirkbride, co-founder and co-CEO of FitLab. In this episode, we discuss the company's integrated fitness platform. Brian talks about partnering with Nike to launch boutique fitness studios and recently acquiring Assault Fitness. Plus he shares FitLab's plan to unite memberships and experiences across its portfolio of brands. Let's get into it. Today's episode is brought to you by eGym. eGym provides fitness and health facilities, with smart workout solutions built on its ecosystem of hardware, software, and partners. But it's more than cool tech. Their connected training experience delivers business results while helping members reach their wellness goals. If you run a gym, health club, YMCA, or any kind of fitness facility, you should check them out. Visit egym.com to learn more. Hey, Brian, welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, I should say welcome back. It's been, I think, a couple of years at this point. And FitLab, you have been quite busy. So I think this is a really cool opportunity to, to catch up and not only get the update in terms of what's been happening, but also where you're going, what, how you see not only FitLab, but the, the kind of industry evolving. And maybe as a starting point, what's the, the kind of uh, state of the union at FitLab? Where do things stand today? And then we can kind of jump into it from there. Yeah, no, it's been, so I looked back, I think it's been right around three years. Um, so it's been a while. Uh, it's been interesting. I think you guys have kind of grown up in a lot of ways alongside us over that period. So it's been fun to follow what you and Anthony have been doing as well. Look, I think the big picture for us is remarkably consistent given how dynamic those three years have been across the industry and the economy in general. I mean, I think all the big picture stuff for us is the same. We are building, we believe, the first truly integrated platform for a new generation of fitness and wellness consumers. I think what's maybe changed on that front is like a lot of people say that now, um, but we believe there's a massive difference between kind of a real integrated platform of multiple brands and just kind of owning a bunch of stuff. If the benefit doesn't reach the, the member at the end of the day, um, you know, we just don't think it's the same thing and, and building a platform on an architecture that allows us to understand where our member is across all of those different experiences is, is not a trivial thing. Um, so we're super excited about that. We continue to believe in the power of magical brands. We think fitness is hard for, for most of us. And if you don't have concepts that really inspire passion and motivation and build community, I think we, we all, you know, it's another thing that we kind of all say but there's magic in how that all comes together. And so we remain super focused on, on building or acquiring or partnering for, for deep, authentic, powerful brands um, that inspire that passion. You know, Ragnar coming out of, of COVID was a, was a mass particip is a mass participation events, kind of team-based uh, events business that we acquired. And you have people getting tattoos because the experience is so meaningful for them. We just acquired, as you guys, I think, broke the news. We just acquired... Uh, salt fitness uh, a week or so ago. And uh, I mean, it is the equipment people love to hate, right? Like this, you, you bring up an assault bike to people and like their body, if they know it, their body changes, like you can viscerally see them go, Oh, God, yeah, I know what it is. And it's awesome, right? Like it is it is this thing that like, has a cultish following across the globe, that people really, really kind of rally around. And obviously, you know, earlier last year, we announced the partnership with Nike, and that's probably the pinnacle of brand passion, frankly. But we just believe that's what it takes in fitness and wellness, and we think there aren't really that many brands that do that. And I think the opportunity is unchanged. You know, when we met, I think, three years ago, was somewhat insightful, I think, for us to be saying, we want to focus on building a new solution for this consumer. Now it's just data. Right. It's their gen millennial and Gen Z consumers are 80% of health club members They're 90% of fitness app users. They train two to three different modalities, 60 
five percent of them prefer to work out in groups like they are we have more gym members today than at any point you know in history like it's just a phenomenal fitness consumer despite the fact that we really haven't like the industry at large still hasn't really figured out how to serve them the best way so i think a lot all the big picture stuff uh has stayed really really consistent for us the steps along the way to how we want to get there very different um, and fortunately, you know, our business itself is, is very different today than it was three years ago. I think at that time we had three brands, we have 11 now, you know, revenues up 10 X rebita positive We're by no means a finished product, but we've gone from kind of that vision of what we hope one day we were going to be to at least in an in integrated solution, one organization, one offering for the consumers across that flywheel that we talked about of, you know, on the services layer boutique studios, digital at home, mass participation events, and then products being equipment, apparel, accessories, and, you know, maybe someday nutrition, although we have a, a, you know, partnership with Momentus today that, that solves a lot of that for us, who we love. And I know Buyers was just on here a, a couple of weeks ago. So we're pretty happy on that front too. Yeah. It's, it's been, like you said, some like similarity in that one of the things we take great pride in is like, you know, there's kind of like no greater feeling of having a conversation with somebody and then going back to them, how, whatever the time later, and then being like, you did the thing that you said you were going to do and kind of like realizing that, that execution piece, which is super difficult. Um, and so having the chance to sit down with you and you're like, yeah, the way that we see it, the integration, the cohesive offering, giving this fitness and wellness consumer everything they want across this journey and not in a way like we kind of, you alluded to there, like not in name only, right? Not in that we own different pieces of this and maybe they integrate or maybe they integrate behind the scenes, but you don't experience that from the member perspective. When you are building the organization, you're thinking about this vision and you know, like this is the kind of end goal that we want to get to, but getting there right, is, is the challenge. How did that have to evolve? And like, beyond this idea of like, okay, yes, integration as the North star is the right thing. But like those steps is like in between what would like take us into like what that process actually was and like how you start to solve for it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, so we believe it's everything right. And, and it is hard. The short answer is you're right. It's just really hard. And so if you remember, if we go all the way back to kind of the founding, I was at Nike um, and we were really the leaders on on the digital side. And my partner, Mike Melby, was at uh, New Evolution Ventures, a uh, holding company with with a bunch of, of predominantly in-person gyms, studios, um, leader in, in in-person. And the idea was, is there a way for us to kind of pull things together so that we can just really accelerate? You know, this was 10 years ago, I think it started in, in terms of like discussions and, and theory. The reality is, as we talked about, building it in a way that passes the actual benefit of those in a, of, of multiple brands and multiple offerings to the member is super hard. So we think of it like a house. If that house isn't built on the same foundation, so when you think of structure, you think of things like how a franchise system can actually deliver multiple brands in multiple locations in a feeling that's one integrated offering, right? And so you kind of get into some things with mom and pop franchisees that make that really hard. So we've had to think about how do you set up a global network of really professional institutional partners where not only will the studio buy your house and the studio buy your office work together, you don't have to worry about having separate memberships there, but also what happens when you want to have eight different brands that people need to access and have re reciprocity with. How do you get to the point where you can actually tell someone to stay home, right? If you've been to the, been to the studio for three days in a row, working really hard, it might be better for you to do an active recovery day. For us, that would be maybe you go to an XPT studio and you do some contrast therapy, some ice heat and some breath work. Um, maybe you stay home and do yoga. If you're just a boutique studio offer, operator, it's really hard to recommend that. I need you to come to the studio. So a lot of things to think about. So we think about the structure side of it. That leads you really to kind of architecture of how do we understand one member, just no matter where she is across that ecosystem, right? Which gets you into a problem that, that our CTO, Greg Sharp, really had to solve when we were back at Nike. 
because this is the same thing, right? How do they know where you are if you're a Nike basketball, you know, customer versus a, a Nike running customer? So I'd build an architecture that lets us have one aggregated understanding of where our member is in that ecosystem. And when you do that, you start to be able to actually understand, you know, we think of each of the brands as like a room in the house. And when you understand where they are in the house, then you can understand how to recommend that they might like this other room over here. It's time for them to visit this room. And if all of the, all of the structure works together, then the business actually works together because I'm, I don't have, we don't have these breaks of, well, we can't tell them to stay home because we only get paid when they show up or we can't tell them to go to XBT because I only own McGregor fast or, you know, Nike running club. So it is a really different thing to build. And I think when we started, it was kind of the anti VC pitch. Unfortunately, like our one thing was, Hey, we want to integrate this five, $600 billion industry. And again, not that we've done it, but now that at least that house, the structure is built and some of the rooms are getting fleshed out. You can actually start to walk people across the rooms. You start to see a lot of the benefits, not just on the cost side, but that's, you know, for us as a business, that's meaningful, but more importantly, on being able to provide a better, more integrated, more holistic solution to the member. Yeah. When you're thinking about the pieces and maybe this has also evolved, when does it make sense or how do you go through the decision-making process of like, this is a brand we should start and invest in, maybe develop. This is something we should acquire. Here's where the pieces are because across 11, like, and even now you're kind of simultaneously like launching concepts while you're partnering on concepts while you're acquiring concepts. So like, what does that decision-making framework kind of look like? Yeah. I think the way we think, well, fundamentally, again, we go back to people have to absolutely obsess the brand and no matter how many times you build something yourself, right? We've everyone, a lot of the leaders on our team and team members have, have been in this industry for longer than any of us would really like to admit. And we may have built or managed or overseen dozens of concepts. You can do the same formula, right? Like we can put the same pieces in place and it just doesn't always hang together the same way with, and have that magic for a consumer. So if we find a brand like, you know, Assault or RPM Training, which is a, a company that we acquired earlier in the year, Sanctuary Fitness, we find these brands that that resonate with people like that in an in an hub or an area that's identified as a as an important either hub in our flywheel, meaning like big sector um, piece, or if we look at the training services bucket a modality or kind of a, a, a niche within that environment that we really like. We're super interested in that. We're very confident that we can build concepts really well. We did that with Rack Studio, a strength-based concept earlier this year that is amazing. And actually like almost two thirds, I think over two thirds uh, female, which is, which is really rad. But if we find great concepts with great teams who resonate and are excited about plugging into our infrastructure, right? We can, we can explain to you how we can help bring this awesome thing to much, many more people and, and help have a greater impact. And I think that is super exciting to some people and not at all interesting to some people. And, and so it's kind of this, this mix of, we focus first and foremost on, is there a thing that people love? Are we confident we can build it? Okay, now we're in a, a buy versus build question. And that just comes down to what's out there. And is it better than we think we can build and are able to get? And then you run into things like Nike, where obviously, hey, if you can partner, if I can partner with Nike, we will do that every single time. There's so many kind of like paths to go down related to that, because if it's a truly iconic brand and it is resonating with people, well, that can mean it's going to be super expensive to buy. And so like, there's that consideration of like, can we get it, which you mentioned, but then there's also kind of these parallel paths where it's like, well, what does that partnership look like with somebody like Nike? So are you kind of identifying modalities and areas within that, that you would like to go? And then you're evaluating partner or acquire, or, or is it more opportunistic in terms of like, this would be the best case scenario and let's kind of like reverse engineer it, maybe some combination of both. Yeah. I mean, I think you always ultimately end up being somewhat market driven, right? Like you're, 
you, you can we, we can build some super pretty PowerPoint slides and you know then COVID hits and I guarantee you know again our, our if, we, if we look at our own story the North Star is the exact same as pre-COVID the steps are not the order that they were in that PowerPoint right by any any even close view so I think you're always market driven I think that we certainly are very thoughtful and structured in terms of both the hubs, those segments that we have in the flywheel, and then kind of within each of those segments, what we think is attractive. It's almost never like there's only one thing that we think is attractive here, right? I mean, it's just an amazing industry. Our members train two to three different modalities today, and those modal those two or three things change, right? As you go through the course of your life. So there's a there's a whole bunch of optionality for the most part. Again, what what there isn't a lot of optionality on typically is more just these the, the brands that people truly love, and so it's largely a, a build by partner. You know, is we we typically very much like control. Again, when we partner, it's it's with things where you just go. You know, again, I'll go to Nike. Like, yeah, all, I mean, hundred percent all day. It's a dream. Otherwise, it's really for us a, a builder by decision, and that tends to be. Is there something out there that we love? And and you're right, we are. We have to be very disciplined on what that looks like because we do believe we can build it. It just might be faster and better if if we find the perfect brand, the perfect team to 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 bring in. Yeah, it makes sense. When you think about that vision, the the integrated, the flywheel, putting the pieces together, how far? Like, if you think of it as like a hundred percent complete in terms of this is what the fully integrated like functional, uh, system looks like how, how far are we to, or how close are we to a hundred percent? Yeah. I don't know if you ever actually get to a hundred percent. It'd be interesting to see if, if we ever feel like, like we're there. Um, I would, again, I go back to this kind of house analogy and what I would say is like the house is built, you know, we've, we've spent three or four years building the foundation, making these rooms, these individual brands feel really deep, really authentic, really powerful, because our view was like the house doesn't matter until the rooms are awesome, right? We're not just going to build this house and you can't just throw whatever's in, whatever you, you find in there and, and go, this is a great place for, for people to come. That's been the last three or four years for us. So the infrastructure is built, that structure is built, the organization, it's one organization. We have amazing brands, amazing team members. The job this year is, okay, well, how do we make sure that our members understand the benefit of the house, right? So we have this house of brands effectively. Now, if you go to like nerdy, you know, kind of business frameworks, how do we make that feel at some point, like a branded house where you go, okay, I understand more and more of our members understand that they want to walk from this room to that room, that people who like these sorts of things, love it over here too. And it doesn't feel spammy. Right. Like the last thing we want is is for someone to feel like, oh, I, I bought an assault runner and I got hit with an email from Ragnar. And, and who are who are these things? Like it should feel awesome because oh, when I went to the Ragnar event, I actually ran on an assault runner there at the at the kind of you know hub. And I love that thing. And they do some integrated training content and right, like it should feel very natural that I'm getting pulled over to these other things that I love because we've built the, the rooms very intentionally around specific consumer archetypes, right? So we know that you're going to love these things, or at least a percentage of these members are going to love these other things. And so that's the job. I would say that the house is built, the process and structure and art with which we walk you through the house is what we get to focus on this year. Yeah. This idea as you're talking about, it's like, what is the fitness industry's like Apple ID, like single sign on? Like, how do I get in there in a way where it doesn't feel spammy? It feels awesome when I put, you know, I just hold my AirPods next to my phone. And it's like, they know it's there. And that that same level of, maybe it doesn't get to that level of integration, but the idea that I don't have to go searching for all of these things. And it's, it's actually as a consumer and as somebody building businesses in the space, driven me crazy that like all of this is siloed. It's like, why, why do I have to like do all this stuff over here and then come over here and then do it? And I'm obviously I'm preaching to the choir in this case, but it doesn't make any sense. And that is the thesis for us, right? Again, you go back to this consumer who is 
spending on all of these buckets, right? If you go to our flywheel, like they spend on all of it. They train two to three different modalities. None of it works together. So they go to different classes and they end up doing deadlifts three days in a row, right? Get injured, get whatever, or they, they don't, they found the thing they like, but it only does this one thing. So they do the same repetitive motion at the same intensity with the same, like it just, it's really remarkably hard and they're spending, but they're not getting great results. It, and it impacts the business. Businesses don't have great life cycles. They don't have great LTVs. So it makes all the sense in the world. But again, like the, the things that you're pointing out are really material structural limitations, right? The industry grew up siloed intentionally. We were equipment manufacturers or we were big box operators or we were mass participation events companies. You've seen consolidations. You've seen people like mash stuff together, but they're on legacy systems. You know, maybe you merge some customer data list, but like, that's not an integrated offering to a consumer. If I sign up for an event, there should be a training program. It should, it should point out where I can go train in person. All of that should use the same equipment. There should be an integrated nutrition. Like all of the, you can only do that if you understand where the member is across each of those points. And that is really, really hard. And even if you look at the kind of infrastructure in the space, they don't want to do that, right? Like there's different point of sale software systems they all want to own own customer id like it's it's a real real infrastructure battle and that's why we we it's not like we wanted to go build uh fit labs from, from scratch and go build our our software architecture from scratch to be able to do that it was a massive pain but if you don't do it that way you can't deliver the integrated solution if you don't build I, can, I gotta stop this house analogy but if you don't build the hallway you can't like move people from room to room right so if you don't have that structure in place if you don't set up your your franchise system in in a way that facilitates people walking back and forth whenever they want between the rooms it doesn't work and all of that once you're built out like to unwind it you got a demo like you got a demo of the house and so it's hard but when you when you put the work in to do it, it's so awesome when you think about what that means for the consumer. So again, now all of a sudden we go, hey, you like to train these three ways. Here's your end objective. Here's what your week can look like. Doesn't matter. You can go to this studio, this studio, this studio. Here's your recovery. You don't have to come in today at all. It's an integrated digital solution. So at home, we're going to tell you, hey, you've been in three days. Why don't you do a recovery day, right? Our partners don't get upset. They're participating in that kind of broader membership cycle. It's the best thing for the, for the consumer. And we have an opportunity to really kind of help them get to their end goal. And obviously selfishly for us, retain them longer. The economics are very different. We can monetize them across the flywheel. But I, th I think when you really think of what it allows you to do for a member, it's pretty awesome. Is it? Because as you think about it, as you're talking about it, like whether it's a holding company or whether it's somebody's doing a roll up or whether somebody there is consolidation and they're acquiring these pieces. It's like, it only, it seems so incremental. Like it only gets you like a tiny bit further down that path. And you maybe even might've experienced this of like, you start doing it and you put the piece together and you're like, we really didn't get anywhere. Like we didn't get anywhere in like a meaningful way to think that it was going to change it. And as you described it, like, that's just how the industry was kind of set up. Do you think there, for anybody who wants to do this in like a, a meaningful way, and there are other folks who are trying to execute kind of similar like versions of this, that the only way to do it is like scratch built or <laughs> kind of like tear it down to build it back up. Would that be accurate? Or do you see there a way that like somebody could come in and say, because I mean, full transparency, Anthony and I have talked about it, like let's acquire this piece and this piece and this piece and people have approached us about doing it and it's like, yeah, it makes sense. But like, besides owning all of those concepts, do you actually get to a place where it's utilized in a way where anybody finds value in it? Yeah. So, I mean, so certainly there's financial benefits to consolidation as an operator, right? If you just ignore the member and, and just go, okay, I can diversify revenue streams. I can, I can be protected from some shocks in the industry if things swing at home or, or, or out. So there's, there's certainly no selfish benefits to the organization to, to do some of that, that I get, I think your question is what's the benefit to the consumer. 
I think the, the answer is always like, well, of course you can deliver some benefits, right? Like you can I think, yeah, I mean, we always think of kind of crawl, walk, run, right? Or this phased approach of what's the, what are the little baby steps we can do immediately that are not super meaningful, but they're, they're beneficial, right? Like should you, should members have a discount across the whole portfolio, right? It's not super meaningful, but should there be a benefit of, of, you know, a reason for you to, to walk into a different room? So yes, there's always little things you can pass on. I think what ends up happening if you don't address the structure is you can't get to run right? Like you can't get to phase three. So, so if you look at the industry, you have things that break down where you can't do a pass across multiple brands because they, they won't work together. So some of them will, sometimes it works. Some guys share, some guys play nice, but not the whole portfolio, not every location. Like, so you just, you kind of got halfway through phase two and, and unless you do the real work, you can't get to, to phase three. And so that's kind of how we look at it. Like it, we have taken, uh, it's been a lot of work to put in structure that today we wouldn't have needed all of this for, right? In terms of what we're doing yet, right? again, we aren't walking you through the house the way that we want to be at the end of the year, but we have this structure in place where we know we can do that and we know we can get to phase three now. The Fit Insider podcast is brought to you by our friends at eGen. This is an exciting partnership for us. And not just because eGym makes some of the most innovative fitness products out there, but because the entire eGym team, led by their CEO, Philip, is committed to making health, fitness, and well-being more accessible for everyone. And that's a mission we can get behind. By combining their smart equipment with integrated software and hundreds of connected partner brands, eGym helps fitness facilities stand out by delivering a personalized, gamified workout experience that improves outcomes and member engagement. So if you're a gym or health club operator, thinking about how to best serve your members while driving business results, go see what eGym is up to at eGym.com. With that in mind and recognizing what it took to get to this place and kind of the vision for it going forward, what does that call it the, the second half, two thirds of 2024 look like this? The, the assault and RPM acquisitions locked, huge step forward, the Nike partnership in place, now starting to really roll these things out integrate them and get to that place where it is more connected, I think, than it more integrated than it is now. Yeah, it's been, I mean, it is the last 12 months have been insane. We closed our B about a year ago. We announced the Nike partnership. We launched Rack. We acquired Sanctuary. We then launched the first two Nike studios, which the reception has been ridiculous. We brought in RPM training, we finally closed assault. We just signed up a, a big master territory deal in the Middle East, which, which kind of goes on top of our Gosaga partnership, you know, in, in the Northeast. Um, like it's just been nutty and I'm super proud of, of kind of the organization. Cause when you're in it, it just feels like molasses, like it's chaos. It's, it's like this weird it's, it's both K absolute chaos and it just feels like it takes forever because you feels like you've been trying to get where you're trying to go forever. And when you get there, you're just sprinting to the next thing, putting out the next fire or whatever it is. So I say all of that because when we look at kind of the rest of the year and we should talk about assault and, and, and RPM and, and Nike at some point, but like when we look at the rest of the year, it is really focused on like, how do we get people to go through that house. So, so yes, you know, we, we are adding a couple more MTAs this year that bring, that should bring our, our studio pipeline back to kind of seven, six, 700, which is kind of where we were pre COVID. So that's all back, you know, gets back to where we want to be. We open our first XPT studio in April, the first Nike running studio opens in April, a bunch more Nike studios open over the summer, but the, the, the real focus for us as an organization is that again, we finally are at that place where you go, Oh my, like it's felt like it was on the horizon forever. And now, now it's, it's there. And so we really get to focus on how do we pass that benefit through to the consumer? There's a whole bunch of that, right? Again, for us, it's mostly about how do we make that feel really organic, really natural, really beneficial, not just, Hey, we'd like to monetize you over here too, right? Like that's the thing we can't 
do. It should never feel that way. It should feel like, oh my gosh, here's this additional benefit or here's this other thing that I love and here's how it works together with what I have. So it's really the fun time. Not that like building stuff is, re- is, is obviously really fun, but it's really hard and it's really chunky and it's re- like, it's really frustrating a lot of times too. And so being able this year to to focus more on pure execution and pure scale versus again, like last year, it was a lot of, of, of corporate development. It was a ton of innovation and creation, defining new concepts and, and figuring out how to launch them. And obviously you launch them and you have to iterate a bunch. Like that stuff is exhausting. And um, not that scaling and, and integrating isn't, that will I'm sure also be more challenging than any of us ever, ever think it's going to be. But it's really cool to think about because it's been isolated a little bit, right? Like each, we have teams working in each of these little rooms. And now with the focus being on like bringing it together for everybody, it's really, it's just a really fun time in the organization. Yeah. You mentioned the kind of most recent deals, Assault, RPM, Nike. It's also from the outside looking in, it's like me having some knowledge, like you obviously came from Nike. Some of the organization also has some ties to Nike. And so in some ways it's like, what a decade plus in the making of like this partnership uh maybe starting with that one like what was the actual like coming to the table wa- and walking away from conversation be like this is going to happen like we're going to be able to bring this to life and like w- what went into that and and how how did it take shape it it has been kind of a 10 year journey and i i have to say like they have so so for me again it is like it's a dream come true. I think, um, they've been amazing partners. We get incredible insight and engagement throughout the organization. And, and if you really step back, like this is Nike's DNA, Phil ran track at Oregon, Bill Bowerman was his coach. Like coaching is the origin story. Nike's mission statement is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And there's an asterisk on athlete. If you have a body or an athlete, it gets the coolest mission statement in the world. And they have done that in product and storytelling better than anybody. And they've been doing it on the service side at the most elite levels forever and at the youth level for a really long time. So Nike studios for us and for them is the opportunity to leverage all of that history and expertise and DNA and pull it through for the rest of us, right? Who aren't at the very tip of the pyramid or, or kind of at the, at the, at the start of our, you know, hopefully, you know, youth activity cycle. And so like us, they believe that there is an opportunity and and a need to, to do things better in the industry, to provide this more holistic multimodality solution for the way this generation of consumers engage with fitness and wellness, not, you know, just the way that the industry wants to engage with the consumer. So it was not fast. They're very thoughtful. They're very smart. They're obviously incredibly protective of, of their brand as they should be, and kind of very aware of the service they need to deliver to their consumers that, that people expect from them. But, you know, they are better than anyone in the world. At it. So it's been, it's been super fun. It's been a lot, but it's been super fun. We have two starts, starts with two concepts. It's Nike training studio, which is really functional training, distilling Nike's decades of expertise, working with the best athletes in the world to a, you know, structured philosophy that's awesome and accessible for everybody. You basically rotate through five different zones, a bunch of different equipment, weights, kettlebells, sandbags, sleds, assault bikes. It's just a ton of variety, but it's structured enough that you're not spending like half of the class transitioning stations. There's different structures to, to get out of this mode of a lot of times what happens right now is you just kind of doing cardio with weights in, in these classes, because it's just because Operators have learned that if people sweat a lot and leave feeling destroyed, they feel good, but obviously they didn't pick up anything that weighed more than 20 pounds and they're not going to really get stronger doing that. So we had to kind of come up with a very different format. We, and we do some of those, we'll do conditioning classes, we'll do Metcon classes, but we also have strength and power classes where we got to slow you down because we want you to pick, pick up some heavy stuff and it's, it's a different focus and there's a lot of education in that. And then we have a Nike running studio. First one will open up very soon in Santa Monica and it's our take on, uh, on a better boot camp. So workouts split between the treadmill and a strength station. 
again, each class with a very specific intent, endurance, capacity, sprint, and some nice touches, um, really Nike touches to deliver on community and deliver on expertise and, and kind of this, this sense of being together. Um, so all the treadmills, you're not just like facing a wall and staring at your console with some, you know, with an instructor yelling behind you every once in a while, like you're all, we're all, everybody on the tread is in a group facing the same direction. You're actually facing a screen that we call the pace screen. That's giving you some guidance and you're able to kind of have a much more shared experience. The, the trainer is able to actually, you know, train you and provide motivation and guidance and not just yell out interval times. And then we get to do some games and some other stuff with the screen where we can really direct you for the specific intent of the session. So if it's a sprint session, we can actually, what, what normally happens is it's really difficult to get people to really recover in between the break, not to get too nerdy about it, but you know, with games, we can really incent you that like, Hey, what we're really measuring here is difference to baseline and you're not going to get rewarded with anything in your recovery period. So take advantage of your recovery period in a capacity class that might be different. We might be trying to keep you level in these different sessions, but the games let us do that in a really interactive way. It's pulling data from the treads and we're able to kind of look at, at, at how we represent that on, on the screen in a fun way. And it helps kind of, you know, break up some of the monotony. So I think it's going to be a super special experience for, for everybody that people are going to love. I know this was, you kind of never wavered on this during the pandemic. It was like, gyms are dead. And it was like, clearly, no, there's going to be the need and the want to come back to in-person social experiences, community, obviously mass participation, mass participation events, like all of that. But at the same time, I thought it was super interesting that you see somebody like Lululemon was like, we're going to acquire me or we're going to go all in on at home when they originated as a brand, a community brand around yoga and in person. And so I thought that was like kind of contradictory while Nike said like, we're going to go the other way while this is happening, we're going to go to in person. So I guess one, an observation and two, like the question, when was this conversation happening? Was it like this predates COVID and then they, they didn't waver from that. And then it ends up coming out on the other side or was it, they were like, no, we are fully committed to like this in-person studio. And like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what this kind of short-term disruption may be to that vision. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's super interesting. I will give a, you know, kind of my perspective on it and I'm sure you'll have, you know, Tal or somebody else on here from, from Nike at some point and, and they can give you, you know, the official, the, the more official story. But look, I think Nike, right, one of the maxims is we are on offense always. And I think you can go back to, you know, what led me there 15 years ago, wherever, whenever it was, you know, was I was in this industry looking around going, well, at the end of the day, I think the secret sauce for most of us in that athlete pyramid is, is a lot more about inspiration and motivation than it is about the perfect guidance, right? I just need to get you up and doing something and, and that's going to be better. And who's good at that Nike. And if you have to go back and like, they went after it, right? Like built out a digital sport team, built out Nike training club, Nike run club, went into, you know, GPS watches, the fuel band, like they, they were a driving force in the foundation of digital fitness full stop. And again, I think that goes back to, it is the DNA of Nike, right? Like this, it's not, should we do this? Do we want it? Like they know they should do it. They have a pretty good business on the footwear and apparel side. So they need to be careful about how they think about that. But I will say they're very serious now about exploring other ways that they can participate in the ecosystem and, and bring and deliver value, whether that's services or some other areas to their member and it, to their, to their members and consumers in a powerful way. So I think they're very serious. They're very thoughtful. Um, I think anybody who thinks they've forgotten how to be innovative or aggressive is like, I would not make that bet, uh, if I was in the industry and I think they do have a lot of conviction. I, I think they do know what they want to deliver to a member. Obviously when you're, when you're a big organization, there's complexity to how you do that. And I think we've been really, you know, we're super thankful that we get to or at least, you know, have, have been working with them on, on how you navigate some of that and how you prove how much consumers want 
this from them. And that's been the most fascinating thing to see with, with the partnership. I and mean, we had big expectations. Don't get me wrong. It's not like we didn't think people were going to respond very positively to the offering, but it has been way above anything that we ever anticipated. As you were talking about, they're kind of leading the way in a lot of respects from digital. They're was the the fuel band that in some ways was a precursor even to the Apple watch. And they got out of the game as Apple kind of ramped up on that side. You mentioned a partnership with momentous on some of the nutrition su supplementation. A lot of times it comes up like a lot of operators of brick and mortar, like how do we utilize wearable data and who do we partner with? And what does that look like? And, you know, there's even, in their heyday, Peloton made some acquisitions down the wearable path that didn't end up panning out. And so the question is like, what role does that play? How do you, do you see that playing a role in like this ecosystem, the, in the integration going forward? Is it like, is that something you want to own or partner with? Or it's like maybe not even a concern because people have their own device and let them make up their own mind. Yeah. Well, I'll give you, I will say that there's, I mean, these are discussions we have across the organization and I won't say that we have an official stance on it. I'll give you, so I'll just give you mine. I 100% think there is value in those utilities and those tools. I think that when, when I've looked at the data and it is a, a little bit dated now in terms of when I was looking at things, but you kind of saw like three days, three weeks, three months, right? You saw kind of from a usage standpoint or a real engagement standpoint which makes sense on a N of one basis. Cause like after, you know, three days, it's super interesting, right? There's kind of all this new stuff and you're figuring it out by three weeks. You kind of have a general sense. Like you look at it and you're like, yep, that's what I would have said. And then three months, if you're still using it, it's typically because you've really found something to latch onto. For me, it's usually leaderboards or other things. That's just what I need to, to kind of get motivated. But if you didn't find that thing, it didn't really work. So, so, I think it's incredible because they are, you're finding a, a consumer, a member who is raising their hand saying, I want to get better, right? They may be new to fitness. They may be whatever, but they're at that moment, they bought that thing because they had this desire to get better, whatever that meant for them. I don't think they're sufficient by their own for the vast majority. We think of an athlete pyramid. I don't think they're sufficient by their own for the vast majority of people. So the question is as an entry then what do you pair it up with for us? Yeah, it may, there may be a point where we go, Hey, this is what we think is really different. And therefore we want to own it because it's not there. Or we think there's a, there's a massive IP, you know, advantage or something. I can't say I'm there today. I think if you want your data, you should be like, we should be able to incorporate that from whatever device or service you're using to get it. And we should be able to help you understand it in a way that matters to you in the context of how we're serving you, right? So if that matters to you, then we should be bringing that ambient activity into, again, we have this opportunity to, to have you in this house. If you want your other data in there from other things, that's great. It should be there and we should work with as many partners as possible. Maybe a couple more questions before we get you out of here, because that one led me to obviously talk a lot about the athlete pyramid and then of course, what goes into that, there are other aspects thinking about the consumer and holistic health, recovery, breath work, XPT fits right in there. But now there's also a huge shift towards preventative healthcare, longevity, health span. Is that on the radar in terms of like, what is that offering maybe look like? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, it's so we refer to ourselves as a fitness and wellness platform, right? And I actually think that that terminology is obsolete. I just, we just haven't figured out how to like, which one is it, right? Like clearly XPT, if you had to bucket, XPT is a great example. It would go into wellness, I think, at least in, in terms of like the studio concept that we're launching. But I don't think it's, I don't, again, I don't think our members think that way. I think they just think of this. I mean, if you remember our first discussion, we actually used to refer to it as performance lifestyle which just doesn't mean anything to anyone, but I think it's more representative of how people think about it, which is, you know, yes, eating well matters, sleeping matters, like all of these things we all know matter as much, if not more than the session you may have gotten in that day. 
And so I don't think our members think in terms of fitness and wellness and recover, like it's all one big flywheel that you have to navigate. So for sure, that includes a bunch of other things that I think historically, you know, would have been segregated into a, a wellness bucket from a fitness bucket. And I think at some point, probably pretty soon, we will have words for for how to think about that whole combined thing. Maybe wellness just wins. I don't, I don't know what it is. But yeah, all those things are super critical. Again, the whole point for us is we don't want you to need to leave the house. If you find something you love, that's awesome. Go use it. That's wonderful. But you shouldn't need to because we weren't there to offer it for you. So I think it's a huge opportunity. I, I think that you will continue to see almost all of the bigger players in the space move pretty aggressively for it. But again, I think it, it gets down to, it's not just grabbing one, right? It's how do you incorporate something in a meaningful way that makes it matter? So I don't think it's, and I think you, I think the major players get that and are pretty thoughtful uh, about it at this point. I think that it's like all that to say, there's still plenty more opportunity. Massive. That's the thing. I mean, you see these, you know, you see kind of, you know, some of those, we've had some of the old incumbents run into some troubles right here over the last year or two or three, or you get these questions about, you know, what's the TAM, how, how big can the market really be? And, and it's, again, you brought up the example of, of hearing everybody during COVID say in-person was, was de- in-person fitness was over, you know, people's routines had changed and they just weren't going to do it anymore. And we're just sitting here like, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now you hear the same thing about, about at home. Now it's at home is dead, which is equally ridiculous. People train at home. They will always train at home. They just do that and some other things. And the same is it's the same thing for kind of this fitness versus wellness. Like it doesn't stop on hit workouts or strength workouts or these individual buckets. Like these, these you're talking about trillions of dollars of annual spend across this lifestyle. And that's really how our, this generation of consumers thinks about it. It's who they are. It's how they manage through life. It's how they stay healthy. It's how they stay fit, but it's also how they stay sane. It's how they stay connected to people. That isn't changing. If anything, it just gets deeper and deeper. Um, and the opportunity gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Very, uh, well positioned to take advantage of all of those things that they continue to evolve, whatever the next modality or definition, however we define wellness and prevention or all aspects of it, longevity. In the near term, as we get you out of here, is there anything, obviously a lot going on and a lot to look forward to, but is there anything in the near term or anything you're particularly excited about that people should look out for, pay attention to um, in terms of what's next? I think we've talked about the big things. We're, we're super excited to be launching uh, the first XBT studio here in the next month or two, first run, Nike running studio in the next couple of months, you know, kind of out having some other pre, there's some exciting news that, that we're looking forward to uh, announcing in, in the relatively near future. But now for us, it's, it's, you know, get our heads down and crank and, and make sure that we're delivering on that next phase of, of growth and value for our members. And the best place obviously 11 brands now to learn about and engage with. So plenty of social media websites, but is just FitLab the main hub? Check it out, go from there. Or where would you point people to learn more? Yeah, absolutely. Start with fitlab.com and uh, there'll be, if you scroll down, there's kind of links to each of the individual brand, little snippets on what each of the brands are about and, and a link out. So please explore, find what you love or, or reach out and contact us and tell us what you're interested in. Yeah, it was awesome catching up. Super exciting to see everything you have got you guys have going on. We'll be following along. So when the news is ready, um, we'll have we'll have tabs on that. But yeah, exciting times. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great to catch up. Really appreciate it. One more thing before you head out. Help us spread the word. Take a minute to rate and review the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, or share this episode with a friend. And if you like conversations like this, you'll love the Fit Insider newsletter. We send it every Tuesday. The link is in the description. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you back here next week.